Hi everyone and thank you for being here tonight. I'm Hannah Hodge with Springfield Community Gardens, a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy and local food. Um, this workshop on diversifying farm income is generously supported by the 2501 grant from the USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. Our speaker tonight is Curtis Millsap of Millsap Farms, um, and I'll let him introduce himself further in just a moment. Uh, some housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, uh, please ask as we go. Um, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type um, in any of your questions during the presentation, and we will stop periodically to chat um, with Curtis about them. There is also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen that you should be able to see. Um, please only use this for comments that help us keep track of the questions throughout the night. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. We super appreciate it. Um, any feedback is welcome. Also, once you leave this workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post workshop survey. This survey is used in Springfield Community Gardens reporting to the USDA, and it also helps us provide meaningful workshops in the future. We would appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to fill that out after this workshop. If you would like to, like to refer to this workshop later, it'll be available on the Springfield Community Gardens Agriculture uh, Workshop playlist on our YouTube. Um, and it, it'll be up by the end of the week. Um, I'll put that link as well as our social media, um, the website and tonight's exit survey in the chat in just a moment. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you all for being here tonight and I'm gonna hand it off to Curtis. All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Okay, super. So let me uh, share my share my screen here. And um, okay, we'll try this. Oh boy. Again. Okay, let's see if we can. There we go. Okay, can we see the slideshow and only the slideshow now? Yeah, looks great. Great. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I'm Curtis Millsap from Millsap Farm. I'll give you a little introduction to the farm here as we go along. But, uh, but the short one that I like to give is by the numbers. Uh, Sarah and I, my wife, have been here for 15 years at Millsap Farm. Um, I am born and raised in Springfield. She's from Colorado. Uh, we met uh, in Colorado and spent some time in California and Colorado and New Mexico before uh, locating back to Springfield. Um, uh, actually about 18 years ago, and then buying our farm about 15 years ago. So um, we have 25 acres. Uh, we've been farming 15 years in this location. We have uh, about two and a half acres of gardens, and then we'll get into more detail about all the other things that we do. Uh, but, uh, but we have an Airbnb, we have a pizza night, we have school tours, we kind of do a little bit of everything, which is why we're here talking about this. So. Um, so let's, let's dig right in. Um, it's always been our belief that we're part of a diverse creation. Um, uh, we look around us and see a tremendous diversity and we don't have to look very far. Uh, this is my family. This is, a, this is a little bit of a dated picture. As you can probably tell, I wasn't white and grizzled. Uh, this, was, uh, this was about probably 15, 14 years ago or so. So, uh, so my daughters, uh, this daughter here, and this daughter here, and this daughter here all graduated high school this summer, this spring. So, so that kind of puts some time on it. But uh, you can see uh, I've got a, a diverse family. We've got five biological and five adopted. This is a little more recent picture. This is still a couple of years old, but it kind of gives you an idea. And, uh, and this, is, this is kind of our view of things. So, um, 
uh, we, we view Millsap Farm as a response uh, to God's call on us. And we have, uh, we love people, we love the planet, so we love working in, in creation. Um, all those things have led us to uh, live our lives the way we have. And so, uh, so what that's meant is that uh, over time, we kind of came from an understanding that we wanted to have kids and work in the outdoors uh, and, and kind of whatever capacity that was going to look like to a more specific version of that, which was uh, becoming farmers. And this seed was, uh, was planted in our lives when we were young. I think, you know, both of us grew up in gardening families. Both of us had grandparents who were still on farms. And so we had that experience, although neither one of us grew up on farms, but, uh, but we loved visiting and, uh, and we loved being in the outdoors and still do. It's still where we go to recreate. It's where we spend the t any of our spare time. And of course, now it's where we work as well as outdoors. So, so we love being um, in creation outdoors. Um, our first real farming experience was in 2003 uh, when we moved back from Springfield to Springfield from New Mexico. We bought a little farm over on Fellows Lake, which is about four mi uh, two miles from us now. And um, sorry, I've said Fellows, but it's actually on McDaniel Lake. And it was a little 10 acre plot with an old farmhouse. And it was, it was a beautiful place. Unfortunately, also 10 acres of rocky north facing slope. So not an ideal market farm, but, uh, but we, we moved from there over to a farm run now in 2007. So this is 15 years of being on this farm. Um, and I love to think that our path to farming is basically a, just a long series of learning from our mistakes. <laughs> uh, but here's our basic premise, which is we wanted to do what we love and we figured out pretty early on that we really should grow or raise things we like. So for example, uh, you know, I, I, I started out raising uh, so a lot of chickens and I figured out before too long that I didn't really like chickens. And so we gave those up, even though in some ways they were pretty lucrative. Um, but I just, I figured out that if I, if I wasn't gonna enjoy doing the work, then I really didn't wanna do that. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, I enjoy all aspects of everything we do. Uh, there's always those tasks that are just kind of necessary chores. But I would say that, uh, you know, we have, uh, we, we love doing the thing that we do as a whole and we love eating the specific things we grow and uh, most of the things we raise, we really enjoy the process of raising them as well. So that's part of the point here. Um, I see that Shauna is having trouble with sound. Is anybody else having trouble with the sound? Oh, she's okay. just processing it through. Just her computer. Okay, yeah, good deal. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good deal. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, getting back a little bit. So what does that mean for us specifically when I say grow or do what we love? Well, then for us, it was the growing is part of it, but really growing in community is a big part of it. Uh, is a bigger part probably. So I love working with people. Um, now, you know, at, uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon at 97 degrees, I do love working with people a little less than I might other times. But even then, I'd rather work with a crew than just all by myself, uh, mostly. And so, so that is a big part of our, cho our choice as we figured out what we're doing, who we are as farmers and so on, was that we wanted to work with people. And so, uh, so you can see that here, you know, at, almost everything we do ends up being a group project. And I like it that way. Um, not everyone would, of course, and that's a, that's a decision that we made specifically. Uh, but it's our, our leaning in, towards community and enjoying uh, lots of people around us and enjoying those people and in combination with the work we do and in the outdoors. I love kids. I've always loved kids. I think they're uh, uh, a tremendous gift and we've always enjoyed having kids involved in every aspect of the farm. And so we built our farm with the idea that kids can be included. Um, as we kind of talked about, you know, how do, how do we make these decisions? Well, this is one of the criteria that we always have in place is, you know, is it going to be kid friendly? If it's going to be able to participate and enjoy, whether they're working or playing or just, or just uh, uh, enjoying, uh, uh, just being part of the activity, 
we want to make sure that that's always kid friendly on our farm. So how do we get from where we are, uh, where we were to where we started? Well, in 2007, uh, we bought this place. It was uh, it's 20 acres. Um, it had a big greenhouse that was, as you probably can see in this picture, it was, it was defunct. It had been uncovered, mostly uncovered for about seven years. There was a sheet of plastic that was sort of still barely draped across part of it. Um, and we have this big house here. It's a 3,200 3, square foot house and a big barn. And that was really the structures on the farm. Um, there was a pad over here that had been a, uh, a mobile home. And there was these spaces here had been greenhouses, but the structures were, were gone. At one time, my predecessor had been growing uh, some things in this space and even a little bit in here. And then he'd raised emus back here in these pens. So he'd been a diverse farmer as well. But, uh, but by the time I got here, it was basically grass and the leftovers of a greenhouse. So right away, we started plowing things up and putting them into vegetables. Uh, we reskinned the big greenhouse. Uh, and so we had about an acre in vegetables the first year. Uh, we did a bunch of broiler ham, broiler chickens, uh, so Cornish cross on pasture, and about 500 of those. And we did 100 turkeys, and we did about 50 layers, and 10 pigs. And, uh, and, and frankly, things weren't very sane. It was a pretty wild whirlwind kind of a year. But, uh, but you know, every once in a while, things calm down enough. And we say one sane moment per day, right? So, um, so it, wasn't, it wasn't out of control, but it was definitely uh, a busy, busy, busy part of our life. And, and you would expect that in startup, right? Uh, but already you can see a little bit of diversity in, our, in the way we're going about things. So we've got vegetables and we've got broilers, turkeys, and layers, um, even, and some pigs. So, so right from the get-go, we wanted to have animals and vegetables on the farm. The next year, we increased our vegetables by about a half an acre. And then we also increased our broilers and our turkeys and our layers and our goats and pigs. And, and this actually was when we introduced goats which was possibly one of the worst decisions we ever made. Uh, we can get into that if, you, if you're interested in why, but, um, but essentially, uh, you know, things were still going pretty well. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't bad in the way we were, we were earning an income and we were enjoying uh, kind of this creation process on the farm. Um, 2000, oops, I skipped here. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I skipped a couple of years there. I'm not sure where those slides went, but. But I, what's important to say is we, we grew up the next, uh, the next year, so 2010, uh, we actually went up to uh, seven acres of vegetables. We borrowed land from the neighbor next door. And we did that until, we did 2010, 2011, we grew on seven acres. Um, we cut the animals back drastically after the first year of growing on that larger acreage. Um, and then the second year, uh, we cut our acreage back, well, after that second year, we cut our acreage back to two acres. Um, and not coincidentally, uh, in fact, very much uh, because of the free time that was, that was acquired by, um, by reducing our acreage, we were able to put in, start doing pizza night. And so that was, that's kind of, this skips to the pizza night. In 2013, um, we started doing pizza night. Now, you notice here, uh, we had cut back, we weren't doing any broilers anymore. We had added some covered space. We had two acres instead of, we last slide you saw was an acre and a half, but I'd gone up to seven acres for two years. Um, and, uh, and then here's a, here's a key thing that I'd like to point out. And I don't, I'm not sure, you know, the first couple of years, there was just very little vacation. Uh, but this 2013, we started taking a regular vacation, regular vacations, five weeks, not consecutively, but spread through the year. And that was a big deal to us. Curtis, um, we have a question in the chat. Lisa G would like to know why goats are not a good idea when um, just in general. <laughs> well, goats seem to be born wanting to die. It was my experience. Um, goats have all kinds of parasites and, uh, and it takes a lot of time to manage that. Now, uh, I have friends who seem to do a really good job managing goats and they seem to be very content and happy to have those goats. My experience with goats was very frustrating. It mostly uh, involved goats getting out of fences that I felt like should have held them, or and then they would come and they would eat the broccoli or they would eat the um, head lettuce or whatever it was you know that was out in the field growing. Not not the five acres of uh, woody brush that you know they're supposed to have a preference for, but they would they would make a beeline for my vegetable fields. Um, I had a really hard time keeping them contained. 
I never got anything really productive out of the goats. We would sell some, some kids each spring uh, for butcher, but it was never uh, enough to really justify the effort and expense of the goats. So that's why for us, it was a bad idea. Um, and, and I kind of mentioned this around the chickens, but it turns out I'm not a very patient person with animals. So, um, you know, vegetables are better suited to me. Uh, or I am better suited to vegetables is maybe the better way to say it. So, so that's kind of the, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Like I say, I have lots of friends who seem to really enjoy and their goat herds and seems to work out for them, but, but it never was a good match for us. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we have uh, the next year, um, not a big difference, but one of the big key differences was pizza night started really revving up. And so, and we'll get into that a little bit, with how that works for us and so on. But, uh, but I'll skip forward a little bit here and say, you know, one of the things that really has happened is that we have developed a diversity of staff on the farm. And that's allowed us to grow things beyond what my family could do. And I'm not just talking about people who come in and work one day, one, one, uh, you know, one season. This is longevity of staff. So this is, for example, my farm manager, Kimby, who's now been with me for 10 years. And Kimby uh, you know, can run the place uh, when I go on vacation and, and really, frankly, runs a lot of the place while I'm here. She has roles that uh, you know, we, we kind of have uh, parsed out our roles. But, but we, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to have staff that's able to do these things. And so I never liked the idea of being absolutely tied down to a farm. Um, because I enjoy travel, I enjoy getting away, I enjoy going and doing things like uh, week-long trips in the Buffalo River or going to, uh, uh, this spring we went to Peru and Costa Rica. Uh, you know, I want to be able to get out and do these things. And the only way I can do that is if I have full-time staff that knows their job, that's been doing it for a while. And so that's a big part of uh, the changes that happened over these, between kind of 2012 and modern day, probably the biggest uh, Um, so this is our perspective that, that we're stewards of this little portion of creation and the relationships that have formed around it. And so kind of the, one of the key relationships that we have is with our personnel. And uh, we've diversified the farm in these four ways that we'll talk about today, but the personnel is the first one. Personnel, production, program, and property. Those are the four that we'll really key in on. So people are the core of a farm. You know, one of the things that I love uh, thing, thinking about is that a farm is, uh, land is only a farm if there's a farm. Okay, because farm, the, the definition of a farm is a piece of land that's being interacted with by humans. You know, otherwise it's a piece of wilderness or it's a, maybe a forest or it may be, but if you want to talk about a farm, it inherently has to have a farm. Um, and so, so people are a really core part of how this whole thing works. Now, um, from our perspective, God's standard is how, of how we treat people is the right standard. And so we really hope that his love shines through us in our relationships. And how does that work? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of different things. Part of it is uh, treating people as equals and expecting great things of them and, and them holding high expectations of us as well uh, in terms of how we treat them, how we treat the land, how we, uh, and treating them, for example, would be you know, if we've always told people family comes first, if somebody has a, something they need to take care of with their family or they have, a, you know, something as simple as a doctor appointment or something as complex as a, as a family emergency or, of course, you know, pregnancy or all these things that happen in life that, that we understand are just part of life. We want people to understand that those can be priorities for them, um, that we don't expect them to, you know, report for duty and turn off all the rest of their life. So that's a big thing. Um, you know, we try and pay as well as we can. Um, that's not as well as we'd like to, because we are still, uh, you know, a small farm. And unfortunately, the farm, the economics of farming are not such that, you know, nobody down over here is pulling down a six-figure salary. But, uh, and, and I think, you know, many of my workers are, would, would earn that and uh, could earn that in a, in a different uh, field of employment. But at the same time, you know, we do what we can. We try and make sure that a rising tide floats all boats, so to speak. Um, part of what it means for us to have diversity of personnel is also to be kid friendly. And I kind of referenced that before, but you know, these are my children. 
But part of the way we've drawn such a quality group of people to work with us is by being child friendly and saying, hey, if you need to bring kids to work, it's not a problem. If you need to bring uh, or you need to take off midday and go home for a couple hours to uh, take kids somewhere or do something as on a regular basis, that's okay too. We're very flexible and that's a big part of how we do this. Um, another interesting part of our personnel is that we work with a lot of uh, volunteers. And so these are people from, who come from town and they want to have a farm experience. So, you know, what's, what's that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things, but, but, you know, generally what it means is they want to come out to the farm. They want to experience growing, harvesting, prepping food, uh, you know, kind of the, all the aspects of that. And uh, they want to get dirty. They want to, they want to experience sweating in the heat and maybe being cold and wet. Uh, and we want to make space for them. And, uh, and frankly, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, they can get a tremendous amount of done in a hurry. Um, at the same time, it's a huge management issue. So, so having volunteers come to the farm is, uh, it just requires a whole lot of me as a, as a head farmer to make sure that they're, they're kept busy, that they're kept safe, that they know what's going on, that they feel like they're participating in part of the, part of the process and that their time is honored. I think it's really important if you have people come out to the farm to help you, uh, whether they're paid or not, I think it's really important that they, uh, that they understand based on what you give them to do, that their time is valuable to you, that you don't just, uh, you know, you're not making work, you know, that there really is important, significant things for them to do. So that's, I think that's a big deal. Um, you know, and we, for over the years, we've had a diversity of employees uh, or a, a diversity of workers, including this young lady was a woofer. And so she's, uh, she's part of the Willing Worker on Organic Farms program. And she came to be a part of the farm uh, for just about six months and came through this program that allows uh, young folks, well, it doesn't have to be young, anyone can be part of it, but they, it does tend to be in the young category. People who are kind of at a stage in life and they might have some time to uh, explore options, see what's out there, and they come along and, and work with us in exchange for room and board. And so this is a really cool program for us. We, we have had a lot of really neat interactions with people, people from all over the world. Now, Karen is from St. Louis, so you know, not that far away, um, but her family actually was Taiwanese, so we had an interest in cultural interaction there. And I've had workers from uh, Spain and France and Korea and all over the place who've come to spend anywhere from you know, a week or two weeks up to some of them have even been here for as long as uh, six or eight months. And it's a really neat way to interact with the world uh, while we stay put. Curtis, we have uh, two questions in the Q&A. Um, one from Lisa G, um, and it's regard to the previous slide. Um, from the slide info, what would you say the premium ratio of ground to undercover growing would be? Um, so my current ratio is about one third of our two and a half acres is covered. So two to one, I guess, is what that would be. Um, yeah, something like that. So, so I am, I am heavily invested in protected growing and we actually are going to circle back around to that in a month too. Awesome. Um, and then the other question, um, is from an anonymous member who says, uh, what was going on with your farm that created a need for volunteers? Oh yeah, so that's a great question. No, I don't need volunteers. I've chosen to open my farm to volunteers. Um, so there's a fine line there. No, I think in terms of getting things done, um, you know, very early on in establishment, there were some times when it was great to have a big army of volunteers to come out and help us clean something up or, uh, you know, there were messes left behind by the previous owner that some of those were really helpful or messes we had made in our early establishment phases that it was really great to have a group come out and help us um, or sometimes when we were establishing infrastructure, those kinds of things. Um, I can think of a couple of days when we built high tunnels and we had big volunteer groups come out. And those sorts of things are helpful and useful. Frankly, most of the volunteer time that we get is more about us interacting with the community than it is about the need for help. I'm generally better off hiring somebody for $12 an hour who I can train and have an expectation of over a period of months or years uh, rather than uh, you know, working with volunteers who usually show up with kids in tow and various expectations of what they're going to do. 
But, you know, I, I think that it's really important. I mean, this is part of that diversity thing is what, what other fruit have come out of hosting volunteers? That's another way to think of it. So for example, um, one of my first uh, grants that I ever received was for a school farm to school program where we went and taught uh, school kids uh, a bunch of, uh, well, did the farming and gardening. With them. And that was a really cool program that I really enjoyed being a part of. And it came about because one of my volunteers said, hey, have you ever considered this? And my organization would be interested in granting you money for that. And I thought, that's cool. So there's a lot of uh, hidden synergies that I think come about just by allowing people to participate in the farm. Uh, but yeah, I think that, I think if a farm is, uh, let's say, dependent on a regular input of volunteer labor to be financially viable, then, um, you know, then, I guess that's a that's a potential business model, but I think it would be a a challenging business model because working with volunteers is very challenging. So yeah, there you go. Awesome, that's it on the chat. Um, uh, thanks so much. Now I said that about volunteers, and I should mention too. I have some awesome volunteers. This is one of our CSA members who's been with us for 13 years. Our CSA has a component where people come out and do 12 hours of work per season. So this is not volunteer time. This is, this is if you want to be part of our CSA, you agree to come do this in addition to your cash output. And, um, and so some of our CSA members have become our have become employees. Some of them have become farmers in other farms. Um, but I think this is one of the really cool things that we get to do is participate with, um, with our CSA members in particular who have long-term relationships with. They get to come out and experience working with their food uh, you know, from the field into the baskets, and that's pretty cool. Um, and we'll come back to this, but this is a school group that uh, that I used to work with. I kind of mentioned that, but yeah, I I did work uh, for about seven years. We did a school to farm program, farm to school program, where we went up to the uh, local elementary school and spent one afternoon a week with uh, kindergartners and fifth graders, and, and that was a not a not a uh, not necessarily. I don't think they ever came to the farm but we went to them and that was a really cool thing that we did. Uh, but it was a fruit of, of the volunteer situation because those, they came about because I had uh, volunteers on the farm who wanted me to come do this. I think you can see what's happening here, um, which is to say these people are learning and experiencing the farm, right? Um, in this case, what they're learning and experiencing is an overwhelmingly weedy field. This was when we had seven acres of vegetables and, uh, and we, we learned a lot. One of the things we learned was don't ever, you know, let our uh, reach exceed our grasp. Uh, but, but I love teaching people about their food. I think that's a really important role for diversified farmers in today's environment because most people don't understand what's involved in growing, raising, producing high quality food. And, and as long as they don't have any idea, then they don't value the food, they don't have value the farmers, they don't value the land. There's a lot of those pieces that I think need to be put in there if we're going to be a long-term resilient agricultural um, a force, so to speak. And of course, the other part of it is, I love that my CSA members in particular get to come out and experience the beauty of this place. Um, and, and surely all of, you know, anybody who's, who's done farming, this is part of why we get into it, but. Farming it can be such a, a aesthetically mind-blowing experience at times. This was one of those days. This was a, an autumn day, you know, 60, 55 degrees, 60 degrees starting out in the morning and beautiful fall crops. And here we are out doing a little weed control on the carrots. And, you know, these people are experiencing sort of the zenith to me of the farming experience in terms of uh, weather and light and uh, what, what an amazing experience for them to see what part of this, you know, what, which one of the parts of this that really drives us, keeps us excited. And of course, on the other hand, we work in days like this, and then we work in days like this. And, uh, and right, you know, right now it's 97 degrees outside, um, and we worked this morning, and there was a volunteer who came out, and, you know, we had six hourly workers and uh, a couple of salaried workers, and we were all working alongside each other, and there is a nobility and a, and a reward in that. Um, in knowing that you've accomplished something difficult together, that you've persevered through difficult situation, 
I think that's really powerful and useful. So um, I hope you guys can see this on my screen. It's behind, <laughs> behind my little thing. Move my, uh, move my thing up. Um, oh, yeah, so here's what I find is that uh, diversity in the farm crew, and, and I'll, I'll just, I'll read this, but you know, family, we got family, we got long-term, short-term, hourly, volunteers, all ages, men and women, all ethnicities, all origins, everyone brings something to the table. I mean, everybody in this picture has contributed to the farm in some way uh, that was unique to them. Um, I'll give you a silly example here. So this is my farm manager. This is my farm manager right here, Kimby. This is her son, Forrest. Forrest just, continue, just uh, plucked 1,000 uh, uh, harlequin bugs off of my brassicas last week. Uh, he put in three uh, two-hour shifts, and, uh, and I paid him a nickel a bug, so I owe him 100 bucks. I, we already paid him, actually, but paid him 100 bucks. And, you know, I, I don't know that very many people would be interested in doing that work, but he was because he's very self-motivated and he's interested in doing things that maybe nobody else is going to do. And, uh, and, you know, this kind of a unique way that he contributed. Um, over here, my, my shop guy, David, who keeps all the engines running and the wheels turning on the farm. Um, David has a, uh, a, a fairly severe uh, uh, form of uh, Parkinson's. It's an unusual form. He developed it very young. And it's mostly controlled, but he can't work a full-time job in most other places. He's an incredibly gifted mechanic and builder, and, and he can do anything, build anything. But working in a mainstream uh, job site is a, is a challenging thing for him. So, you know, he can contribute here in a way that he might not be able to contribute uh, out in the rest of the world because the expectations are different there. Um, that's not the right way to say it. It's not the expectations. It's that, that we have uh, created space that works for someone like him to be able to work here. Um, and so, so that's kind of the, that's, you know, a couple of examples, but I think to me, diversity is not about, um, it's not about like trying to go out and find people. <clears throat> it's more about living with open arms and recognizing the value in each person who comes your way and being willing to, uh, to include them in whatever's going on on the farm. And so that's really what, what we've done over the years on this side Okay, so that's personnel, production-wise, and this is this is where uh, you know we get into some nitty-gritty in terms of of what we're growing. Feel free to ask questions about this. I'm not going to dwell on all the crops we grow because that would be, in fact, is its own uh, presentation. I think we've already done one for Springfield Community Gardens about uh, crop planning, but we diversify in the following ways. Okay, so uh, for example. We do a lot of different varieties and products. We'll get into that. Uh, we do uh, throughout all four seasons. So we can diversify by growing different crops in different seasons or the same crop in different seasons. We can also diversify by providing different environments. And again, we'll get into that a little more. And then we also, in our production, have a variety of marketing methods. So this is, uh, this is two year old information, but it's pretty similar still. 238 varieties. Um, that's, that's a whole lot of varieties. Why do we do that? Um, well, here's an example, some of which are resistant or tolerant to nematodes, for example, um, in the case of cucumbers. Some of the varieties of peppers might be resist resistant to bacterial leaf spot. Um, summer squash, some seem to be more and less attractive to cucumber beetles, et cetera. So in any given year, it seems like some crops do really well, some crops do less well. Um, and then some of that, Within, within like the beets, for example, you know, some years the red beets seem to outperform the, the Kyoja beets, the striped ones, and then other years the, the, the tables seem to turn. So having multiple varieties and then a wide diversity of vegetables that we grow insulates us somewhat from some of the vagaries of the, of the, of the, of the weather, of the soils, you know, those kinds of things. It helps us just have a little more, um, consistent harvest. So that, that's one example of ways we diversify. So how do we manage that? Well, we do, we have a very extensive slide, uh, screen, uh, sorry, uh, um, what do they call these things? Uh, 
database. Spreadsheet. Um, spreadsheet, thank you, that's the word. And, uh, and we have a, a spreadsheet that includes, oh golly, I think it's like 600 or 700 entries um, because a lot of plants get multi planted multiple times. So you can see here, um, let's see what it's a good example. You've got uh, lettuce here, for example, the baby head lettuce. Well, that's gonna get planted uh, maybe up to 10 times through the summer. So each, each planting has its own entry. Uh, the point is, if you're gonna be diverse like this, it is gonna require a tremendous amount of energy in terms of managing that diversity. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's just something you gotta recognize. Whereas if all you're growing is you know, 10 acres of sweet corn, there, there's a whole other set of management tasks that come with that. But the thing you're not managing is how many, you know, you're not, you're not needing a 700 row spreadsheet to manage uh, a couple acres of sweet corn. So, so that is a, a plus and a minus of this. You know, on the one hand, uh, we, we're not subject to, I mean, if, if the sweet corn doesn't make this year, that will really not affect our income very much. Because if the sweet corn doesn't make, then that probably means that the, you know, the lettuce is going to do better because it's a little cooler or whatever. There's a lot of variables there. But, but the point is, uh, this diversity does protect us. It also creates its own whole set of uh, headaches and, and hassles. But let's, what does that look like? Let's operationalize this a little bit. So first week of May, these are CSA shares. So these are, uh, these are actual shares that we boxed up and sent out the door. Uh, this, this is uh, from a couple years back, but this is pretty similar to what we're still doing. Actually, this is a lot of greens. We would try not to have quite this many greens, but sometimes May is like that, right? So here's a, a head of lettuce over here. There's some salad mix. There's another head of lettuce, a bag of spinach, bundle of kale, bundle of radishes, bundle of green uh, spring onions, uh, some as asparagus, some strawberries, some arugula, and uh, zucchini. Um, that's coming, the zucchini is coming out of a greenhouse. Probably one or two heads of lettuce is as well. The rest of it's probably field grown. First week of June, uh, carrots, radishes, beets, squash, snap, sh sugar snap peas, which by the way, I do not think sugar snap peas ever make, uh, make sense financially. I grow them because my CSA members love them. And it's nice to have them once or twice, but we do not spend any more time or energy necessary on them because they are, I, I'm convinced, a financial loser. Uh, a bundle of mint. This is a crazy thing because anybody who's ever grown mint knows it grows like a weed, but people will buy a lot of mint. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, it's more spring onions, a couple heads of lettuce, bag of salad mix. So this is, or this is early June. Here we are in July, an abundance of strawberries and eggplants and cucumbers and uh, bell peppers, basil and you know, all the hot weather crops. Uh, we did not grow this melon. This melon would be something we would supplement with. So one of the ways we diversify is by not growing all of our own produce. We do buy in some produce. Everything else you see here, we grew on our farm, but the, uh, sorry, not the peaches, no, the peaches and the melons, uh, both would have been things we'd buy from another farm. Celery. There's a weird one that probably uh, a lot of uh, gardeners in the Ozarks don't grow, but uh, it's a really great crop for us. And it's a good example of something that, that helps to keep things diverse. And, you know, celery is great in all sorts of salads and things. So people love having that this time of year. Um, and then let's flip the calendar a little bit. Here's Ju January, right? So here we've got some storage crops, like these carrots are probably coming out of storage. They may still be field dug. Um, the beets are probably coming out of a, a high tunnel. The, the squash would have been harvested in the end of summer and, um, and held until this time. The leeks are coming out of the field still. The sweet potatoes are storage. The, uh, the Jerusalem artichokes, we often dig those as we need them out of the, out of the uh, beds in the, in the winter. A couple of heads of lettuce, bag of spinach, a couple of bok choy. These would be coming out of uh, high tunnels probably. And, you know, again, just I think you've got the idea. We, we grow a really wide array of crops and we grow them throughout the year. Now, another way to do a diversity in terms of seasonality is to, to storage crops. And I kind of alluded to that with the sweet potatoes, things like that. Onions are a big storage crop for us. So we harvest almost all of our onions in the beginning of the end of June, beginning of August, uh, sorry, beginning of June and uh, uh, into the beginning of July. There's about a month harvest period there, but we sell and distribute onions Throughout the uh, throughout the rest of the year, so up until December, we usually have crates of onions in our cooler that we're still giving out. So in this case, we harvest the onions, we dry them in in uh, 
we don't use these crates anymore. We have bulb crates that we use in the greenhouse with a fan, keep the temperature up, the humidity low, and they cure out in about uh, 10 days. And then we move them into our cooler where they'll hold pretty well until about December. Well, the latest we've ever eaten onions out of the cooler is really more like April, but usually we're trying to sell them by the beginning of December, or middle of December, because the, the, um, we do start to get some, some spoilage as we get later into the winter. But uh, we grow a lot of onions and we grow them because they're really reliable storage crop, they're highly desirable, easy to store. And, uh, and it's an example of ways to diversify and kind of secure our income. So, you know, even though the onions, uh, well, so, so the onions are dependent really on the weather in March, April, May, June, but we're still selling them in July, August, September, December, uh, through December. And so I think of that as an interesting way to diversify our timing and our income and our sales. Uh, kohlrabi, it's gotta be the king of diverse vegetables, right? I don't know if anybody's uh, grown kohlrabi. They're fun, they're very tasty. You have to uh, introduce them to people. There's a limited market for them, but they're a pretty fun crop to grow. As opposed to like cherry tomatoes, which everybody knows and loves and are very snackable. And so, uh, but you know, also are a lot more labor than kohlrabi. But uh, diversification there. Broccoli is a good example of, a, of something we do a lot of in the early season. We take a big break in the summer and then we'll plant a bunch of fall broccoli later. So this kind of gets diversified both in terms of, of uh, variety and season, because we grow several different varieties, some that are uh, more suited to fall production, some that are more suited to spring production. Uh, I think we've gone mostly to uh, um, uh, Arcadia for our fall production. We're pretty happy with that one. Radishes are almost a year round crop for us. There's very few years, uh, weeks of the year when we don't have some radishes available. Cucumbers are very seasonal. So cucumbers for us start around the 1st of May, coming out of the greenhouse. And they'll go through the summer and usually they'll go till about November, but we don't try and do any winter production of cucumbers. Carrots are something we have year round, whether they're coming out of fresh field grown, like these are, these are probably January carrots. I'm just basing on the, what the tops look like, um, but they have grown really in the fall. So we probably planted these in the first of September, end of August, somewhere in there. And, uh, and then they grew all fall because they stopped growing when it gets really cold, uh, but they get better and better tasting. And then we usually dig those as we need them. But then in the summertime, we'll grow a big crop in the spring and then we'll dig all those and put them in the storage because they taste better if we dig them in June, July and then sell them out of the cooler through August and September rather than trying to grow them, harvest them for that late in the year. We find the flavor gets pretty strong and a little unpleasant. And then here's a good example of um, fall, late fall, winter cropping, a lot of daikons, turnips, radishes, uh, some leeks. So, you know, kind of a diversity of crops through the seasons, but definitely leaning uh, into some of those less common root vegetables in the fall and winter. And we do it to a diversity of tomatoes. I mentioned that before, but we grow big red slicers. We grow little cherries. We grow uh, hybrids. We grow uh, heirlooms. We really mix it up on the tomatoes and we have a market for all. So that's a that's part of why we keep that diverse because the market is, is uh, demands there will, will absorb that, but also because it turns out that some years the red slicers just beat everything all the heck and you know, you get so many red slicers out of them, uh, the hybrids. And then some years the heirlooms really do very well. And so it's hard to predict. And so by having a diversity of tomato offerings, we also uh, kind of insulate our tomato supply. You see that in the bell peppers as well. Same way we grow about six or eight different types of bell peppers. Now, a totally different product that, uh, that we didn't always grow uh, is flowers. And so, uh, so years ago, uh, when we started, we were gonna be strictly food farmers, you know, raising pastured poultry and, uh, and we were raising uh, vegetables. And so I was not interested in growing flowers. But a few years back, um, we had a conversion. And, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you the story because it's it's worth telling. But um, we were we were harvesting one day, and this was this was pretty early. This was probably 2012, so a little over 10, right around 10 years ago. And uh, we had one of those weeks when the CSA, the, the which is our primary, they, they are are first in line for all the vegetables we produce. They had had a pretty good harvest, and we we stripped the fields, 
for them. And what was left for market was basically a bunch of radishes. And so Sarah and I, my wife and I are out there harvesting radishes and we're going, uh, you know, this is gonna be a pretty barren table. This is gonna be a pile of about 75 bundles of radishes and nothing else. And uh, Sarah said, well, why don't we take some, some flowers, you know, some, uh, some marigolds and zinnias to market? Uh, because I'd always grown little strips of marigolds and zinnias along the edge of the garden just for aesthetics. And, you know, maybe they helped with pests. Maybe not, it's hard to say, but, but I liked having them around. And I said, oh, you know, no one's going to be interested in buying marigolds and zinnias. Um, they grow like weeds, right? And uh, she said, well, you know, just let's just fill up the table. And so I said, sure. Okay. So we, har we harvest some bundles of marigolds. Bundles of so we, we stick them in buckets of water and we take them to the market. Uh, by the time... Uh, you know, 7 a.m. rolls around. We've we've been up for a couple hours. We've set up our table and our our tablecloth at market. We've built this mountain of radishes. Then we got a couple buckets of flowers on the other side. And this couple walks up, and they are they've got their five dollar latte in one hand, and they got their three dollar donut in the other hand. And they point at my radishes and they say, "How much are those?" And I said, two dollars and fifty cents for those radishes. You know, they're fresh, just washed, picked yesterday." And uh, they said, "Oh." How much are the flowers? And I said, the flowers are $12 a bundle. And, and they said, we'll take two. And you know, there you go. It is, I, I was, I was, could not believe that people would prioritize flowers that way. And uh, but but you know, I am not uh, that big a fool. And so I said, all right, we're gonna grow more flowers. And so for a little while I grew flowers really as a mercenary. And, um, and so, you know, we would, we would grow these flowers, we'd cut them, take them to market, and it was just for the money. And I was telling a friend of mine this a couple of years back, and, and uh, she's a very wise woman. She said, she's a, a doctor, and she said, do you know uh, that Americans are deeply unhappy? And I said, uh, well, I, you know, I guess I didn't really realize that. I'm, we're pretty happy around here, but, uh, but we get a lot of sunshine. We're out in the open air. And she said, yeah. Well, Americans are deeply unhappy and they have a lot of issues. And, and she said, it's been shown that for some people, well, research studies have shown that for some people in some circumstances, having cut flowers around the house is as effective as taking a Prozac a day. Now, of course, that's not you know, medical advice, but she said, this is just, uh, this is just research says that there are, there are lots of good benefits of having flowers around the house. She said, don't feel bad about being a flower mercenary. You're just a happiness dealer. And so that was a great moment for me. I'm, I went from being uh, this guy who was just doing it because there was money in it to realizing that I was making people happy. And, uh, and that's a noble thing, you know? And then what we've also learned over the years as we've grown more and more is that having this diversity of blooms in the field is also a huge ecological advantage. It gives us advantages in terms of cover crops. Um, it gives us perennial crops that will persevere that we don't have to reestablish every year. So, Here's an example of some peonies, which are a you know, wonderful perennial flower, uh, very high value, uh, very reliable. Um, we're using some, some of our raspberry trimmings. I mean, this was a job we had to do anyway. We got to go in and trim and, and thin out the raspberries, but now we can thin those out and put them in bouquets. So anytime you can take something that what used to be a waste product and turn it into, uh, into something that's, that you value, well, that's you know, an obvious win. And then, you know, look at this. Here's a, here's a farmer's market customer. It's clear that flowers made her happy. She was enough to make her want to take a picture of it, put it on Instagram. And um, I'm all in favor of that, right? Let's, let's make the people happy, give them what they want. So, okay, so that was flowers. Now, uh, we did talk already about how we farm year round. Let's take a look at some of the structures we use. Uh, we use big high tunnels, um, not long high tunnels. I'm not a big fan of those, but our, all our high tunnels are 96 feet long. But we have a 34 foot high tunnel, a 30 foot high tunnel, um, a, uh, another couple of 20 foot or 22 foot wide high tunnels. Um, and we have our big greenhouse, which is 6,000 square feet. Uh, and then we have several smaller uh, tunnels as well. So all together, um, I've lost track recently, but I think we're a little over uh, 35,000 square feet under cover. So that's a lot of covered space, as I said, about a about a third of our production now is under cover at about two and a half acres. So high tunnels, greenhouses, primary difference for me between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is that we heat the greenhouse. We keep our greenhouse above freezing. But by providing a diversity of environments on our farm, we just increase our odds of success. And, um, and I'm not gonna dig in again to tunnels, 
Uh, we have some other great presentations and you're welcome to come out to the farm and check out all the tunnels and, and different environments. But, but in, uh, let's, let's just say that that is a huge part of how we have kept things productive, insulated. I mean, you know, you don't have to go very far to see the first really wet season and makes all the outdoor tomatoes melt down because of all the fungal and bacterial diseases and the tunnel tomatoes are still kicking along and producing a crop. You go, okay, that tunnel just paid for itself because now I'm gonna harvest $10,000 worth of tomatoes out of that space that otherwise I would have gotten zero out of. You know, I just would have done the labor of raising the tomatoes and trellising them, but I would have actually not uh, harvested anything. So, so that's, the, that's why we do that. Now, um, marketing wise, uh, is there any, any questions about that production end of things uh, before we move to marketing here? Yes, there are um, a couple of questions. One is, uh, what was Harvest on Wheels? Uh, I believe Harvest on Wheels, if, if it's what I'm thinking of, is the uh, uh, Ozarks Food Harvest. So they come out and glean uh, our fields and they'll also pick up things that, you know, if we have an oversupply of lettuce we've already harvested from the cooler or something like that, uh, they, they bring their truck out. So they come out weekly. And um, I think last year they brought home something like 5,000 pounds of produce to, uh, to homeless, or not just homeless, but poor folks in, in Springfield area, uh, people who were food insecure. And so we love being a part of that system. Awesome. And then the second question is from Melissa Campbell. Um, oh, there was also a really sweet comment that uh, you do provide recipes in the CSAs and that they're very helpful. Um, Melissa Campbell asks, can you recommend a guide to help with uh, when to plant veggies spring fall from Missouri. Although I think there are other workshops that address that. There are, and that's what I would recommend because I do think that it's fairly specific to the Ozarks um, just because our climate is a little bit different than everybody else's, right? Uh, but yes, um, you know, check out our other resources. Um, and then in a bigger picture, I love using uh, Johnny's uh, seed catalog. Johnny Seed has a really great set of resources in their catalog that give great dates and times. They've also got online resources with spreadsheets and, and uh, different charts and, and things that will help. And what, all, what those do, you really just key off of our first frost date, which is the first of May. Sorry, last frost date was the first of May or our first frost date, which is the first of October. And so if you kind of know those numbers, then that gives you a rough idea of when to start. And then from there, it's really a matter of experience and saying, when can I push the boundaries? So for example, we plant our tomatoes, we seed our tomatoes in January, we plant our tomatoes into our high tunnels around the 15th of March. And that means we usually have tomatoes uh, always by the 1st of June. Um, usually, uh, I will cherry tomatoes by the 1st of June. Usually we have slicers by the second week of June, somewhere in there. And so uh, we learned that because we kind of read, studied a little bit, but then we just started pushing the boundaries a little bit to see where we could, where the time could, you know, what worked effectively. And um, so that's part of it too, it's just talk, trial and error. But yeah, those, I, I'm glad to share that too. I've got a spreadsheet that I'm glad to share. So if you wanna email me, I'll forward you a copy of that. And, and uh, you, can, awesome. you can wade through 700 rows and figure out what we do here. Yeah, yeah, I included your email in the chat. So um, that's available um, for reference. There are two more questions. Um, one is, why do you think it's important to diversify income? One. And the second one is, uh, what has changed in farming that you feel the need to diversify? Yeah. So I don't think anything's changed. Diversified farms have always been where it's at. I mean, historically, everyone had uh, multiple things going on on the farm, right? So uh, even, even Iowa, you know, until very recently, was all about hogs and corn being on the farm. Uh, and now they've gone to corn or hogs. It's, it's, it's becoming less and less common for these to be diversified. So, so if anything, uh, the farming needle has been working away from diversity into um, single species, single crop, or you know, just commodity cropping or things like that. Historically, farms always did a lot of different things. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. That is, it's insulation, right? It's insulation from the vagaries of climate, um, I mentioned the possibility of a, of a wet summer. So for example, you know, a couple of years back, we had a really wet summer. All the outside tomatoes just melted down from bacteria and fungus. Well, that's nothing new. I mean, people have been having wet years for years for, for, since there's been weather, you know? 
Um, but that year, if I had only been relying on tomatoes as a crop, I would have been you know, 90% short of my income goals. Um, now having some undercover helped a lot, but you know, I had at that time, I was growing still about 90% of my tomatoes outside. And so two things came out of that. One was I put up a lot more tunnels so I could put more tomatoes undercover. And also I, was, I still had lots of lettuce. I still had lots of radishes and carrots and things like that that didn't mind the extra rain. And so by diversifying, I can insulate myself against things like that and, and vice versa. You know, this summer, as hot and dry as it is, the bell peppers and tomatoes are still chugging along doing pretty well. Whereas, you know, the head lettuce gave it up uh, three weeks ago. The, uh, you know, we haven't seen spinach since the first of June. So things like that, uh, you know, we just have to be ready to flex and having a diverse crop mix really assists with that. Awesome. That's it on the questions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about marketing and then we'll dig into the other things we do on the farm besides production. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm not gonna get too far into this because again, we have a great presentation on here about all the different ways we market, but, but here's our big five. Uh, we do community supported agriculture. About 75% of our vegetable and flower sales go through our CSA. And this is a group of people who buy a share up front and they come out and pick stuff up or have it delivered to their home or pick it up at the farmer's market once a week. Uh, or they can pick up every other week. There's different size options. There's different expenditures. So this year, the very smallest share they can get is a $20, I think $22 a week. But of course they can do it every other week. So their expenditure is really $11 a week. Or they can go up to, I think I've got a $72 a week share right now. And that includes fruit and vegetables and, and can include flowers, cheese, uh, eggs. Um, they can order meat through that system. They can have just a really wide variety of crops, many of which we raise, some of which we don't. We're always very transparent about where those crops come from and how they were raised or those food products. Uh, for example, we've got some friends who grow really great. Uh, they, they produce really good kimchi and sauerkraut up in the Kansas City area. And so we'll tell people that story, tell them about where it comes from, how it's done, why we think it's a good crop, a uh, good value, I'm sorry, good uh, 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 product. And then we get this, uh, you know, we get to, to share that with our community support agriculture members and we get to make some money doing it, right? Now, farmer's market, our farmer's market is a producer's only market. So we can only bring stuff there that we raise. But the great thing about farmer's markets is you're gonna interact with a tremendous number of customers. My CSA, I've got about 250 CSA members this summer. Um, at farmer's market, we're gonna interact with a couple thousand people a week. So a much higher number of people, but very few of those people are gonna spend $72 with us weekly at the farmer's market. So from that perspective, the CSA you know, leads the charge that way. But the farmer's market's a great place to get exposure, uh, to get our name out there, to meet new customers, to uh, introduce people to eating local and eating fresh food. So those are really valuable markets for us. Uh, we do do some restaurant sales. Um, we do less than we used to, but it's still a couple hundred dollars a week. And it's a pretty minimal uh, effort on our part. We send them an email list on Mondays. They order on Tuesday, we pack it and uh, harvest and pack and deliver it on Wednesday. Um, they do not get a very big price break. It's about a 10% price break uh, because their volume doesn't justify it. And, um, you know, and, and we have markets for these things. So we're not, we're not inclined to give people big wholesale breaks. Which brings us to grocery stores who expect a big wholesale break. And partly for that reason, we just don't do very much business with the grocery stores anymore. We used to do more, um, but uh, we found that grocery stores were sometimes challenging customers because they were dependent on the, uh, the relationship with the, with the produce manager. And that really is something you've got to tend weekly. So my farmer friends who do produce, who deal with grocery stores, they, they pretty much all deliver personally and they have a conversation with their produce manager as often as they can to just keep themselves in front of the, the guy and the gal who's gonna make the decision on what to buy and when to buy it. Um, but grocery stores can be a good reliable customer. We just, we just don't do that anymore. And then florists, this is a growing market for us with the cut flower market. Um, most of our flowers, about 70% uh, or so, go out as bouquets that we actually arrange and then sell at market or send out through the CSA. But another 30%, and maybe more than that this year, 
is going to florists in our community. And they do that, we do that through a co-op. Uh, we used to do that through direct sales. We've, we've moved toward more of a, it's not actually a co-op, it's a, uh, uh, an exchange. So it's a, just a place where we list things online with a bunch of other growers. And then we conglomerate those orders and we'll bring those to the florists. And that's been a really productive system for us. And, uh, and that's nice. It still gets very, uh, very good price for the flowers because florists don't expect a big wholesale cut. They're going to get their money by arranging it all and making it, you know, into an actual arrangement. Um, and they expect to spend a fair bit on flowers. So that's been good for us. Okay, so what other things have we done to diversify our farm? Programming. Um, we diversified our programming by offering school tours and pizza nights. I won't get into the school tours a whole lot. I think they're fun. We have not really uh, done enough of them to, to say that, they pro that they're really economic drivers on the farm, but I enjoy doing this work. I enjoy bringing groups of kids out to the farm. My, uh, my children enjoy interacting with them as well, and they get to be the leaders, and they get to be the teachers, and that's a really valuable thing for me. I think that's, uh, you know, to teach my kids to teach is super valuable. So we do it partly for that. It's not that it's not uh, fiscally remunerative either, but it's just you got to line up a lot of tour groups to make that make sense over time. But, you know, I, I have um, several times a year, uh, we have tour groups come out, and it's usually about $1,000 a day for students to come out and do a tour group with us, a tour with us, and then uh, sometimes we'll have them, allow them to make pizza as well. Not every time, but uh, it depends on what they want to spend and so on. We do have a, 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 a pricing structure for that that we formalized a few years back. And so that helps a lot that we now know when somebody says, hey, I want to come bring kids to the farm, we can very easily point them to the right place to look into that. And that very quickly sorts out whether they're interested, whether they really are interested in them or not, right? Because, I mean, they might have been interested when they, when, if they thought they were going to spend a dollar a head. When they find out they're going to spend somewhere between five and nine dollars a head, then that sorts them out pretty quickly. That said, we still have hundreds of kids come out every year. So, uh, Fair Grove uh, fifth grade class has been coming out pretty consistently for about six years now, every spring. And it's a great group. We love having them out. It's about 110 kids. And then there's about another, uh, usually, 15 or 20 parents. It's a great opportunity for us to teach young folks about agriculture and to inspire their farming dreams, frankly. Was there a question about the school tours? Uh, yes, there are two questions. Uh, one is your email, which I was going back in our email exchanges and I wasn't able to find it. Um, is that something that you would like me to type in? Sure, um, I could do that. And then uh, another question is, uh, what is the price range that you charge for, charge for bouquets at the farmer's market versus included in the CSA? Meaning, uh, what is the price breakdown if you're included in the C CSA versus the market rate for um, just a bouquet? Okay, so there's kind of two questions rolled up in that one. Um, and I, I think there should, I just try to put my email in the chat, so hopefully that popped up for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the first question in terms of just, uh, just current pricing, um, <laughs> you would think I would know that off the top of my head, right? I believe that market bouquets right now are $22, um, something like that. Maybe it's actually 25. And, uh, and then we do three different sizes. Some, it depends on the, the week, but we usually have a large bouquet and a small bouquet. And then occasionally we'll do like a single, single species bouquet. So it'll just be, you know, a bouquet of peonies or a bouquet of tulips or something like that. And those will be um, kind of what we call a medium bouquet. So, uh, so those price, price points are typically uh, between 22 and 25 for the large bouquet. Um, a medium varies a little bit, but oftentimes around 17. And then a small bouquet will be $7. Um, again, that's some flexibility in there and those prices have gone up consistently over the years um, because the demand keeps exceeding the supply. So as long as that does, then we tend to bump our prices up. Um, now, the second question is, is CSA, what kind of price discount do CSA members get? And the answer is none. That is not a intuitive or popular answer. Um, but it's the, the answer we've arrived at over the years because of this. Uh, the CSA in many ways is a special service. 
we are allowing them to be first in line. We are writing a newsletter for them. We are uh, creating delivery opportunities. We're creating different, uh, different ways they can get their produce. We are customizing shares for them. We are tracking payments and, uh, and allowing them to you know, purchase their vegetables in advance. There's a lot of things we're doing that cost us time and energy. Um, and, and please don't hear me say that I'm not grateful for the commitment and, and the, uh, the incredible you know, aspects of CSA that I love. We totally are. But we just also recognize that there's a lot of other pieces of that that cost us as a farm and as a community on, I mean, as workers on the farm, cost us a lot of time and energy. And so uh, initially we did have a discount attached to the CSA. And then as we, over the years, we talked with other farmers and we, we looked at our efforts and realized, wow, this, the CSA is actually a lot more work than it is just to go to market. Because when you roll into market, you just pile it high and watch it fly, right? It sells or it doesn't. Um, but, but every week there's just zero commitment. You show up or you don't, you know, if you got something going on, don't go to market that week, that's okay. You absolutely ha can't do that for CSA, right? I can't, I can't email my CSA members and say, hey, next week, guys, I'm going to go to vacation and I'm not going to be there. You know, no, no vegetables for you. Um, so there's just a lot of pieces of that. So we've, we've stopped doing a discount with our CSA. Now, they don't get an upcharge either. You know, it's, it's revenue neutral because the, our reward, of course, is that they are consistent customers. And so that's a big deal. Uh, but that we pay for that consistent customer base uh, by, by maintaining relationships and time, you know, all the time invested in that. So, so that's a little bit complex answer, but I think it's worth saying. There is this idea, and people often uh, come to CSAs kind of looking for a bargain. And I, I really push back against it nowadays and say, hey, just so you understand, you know, this isn't a this isn't a price break attached to this. This is a extra service that you're getting, and and we love having you here, and we want you to be here, and we will serve you so well, you'll be thrilled. But we just want you to understand that you know you're not going to save money being a CSA member. You may get the, the raspberries that nobody else gets because all the raspberries are going to be spoken for and they're not going to be at a market. You know? So there's those kind of rewards are, are difficult to put a price on, but I think it's worth something. Awesome. That's it on the questions for now. All right. So pizza. Um, and I think we're doing good on time, but I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try and be disciplined here. Um, so pizza is uh, Something that we started back in 2012, well, we built the oven in 2012 and started practicing on friends and family. And I was ready right from the get go to start selling tickets. And Sarah said, hold the bus. Let's make sure that we know what we're doing before we do that. And, and that probably tells you a little bit about the dynamic in our family right there. Uh, so she said, you know, let's hold up. And so we spent uh, the, most of about, about six months or so practicing on friends and family, developing our recipes, developing our crust, figuring out our process. And then in 2013, we opened up to Pizza Club members. And so Pizza Club is a, a group of people who can become Pizza Club members just by signing up and being part of Pizza Club. But they come out to the farm um, and enjoy wood-fired pizza on the farm every Thursday evening from May to October. Um, they're not committed to a whole season. They, they buy their, or make their reservations week by week. So, uh, But it, on any given week, about 50% of our uh, pizza member, pizza uh, folks are you know, somewhat regulars, so probably come out uh, four to five, some of them even by season passes, so they come out 24 times a year. And then there's, there's always new people as well. And so that's kind of a fun balance. Let's see here. Um, we do a wide variety of toppings on the pizzas. So here you can see where we've got a garlic, onion, potato, and red sauce pizza. Um, they all go through this, uh, these two uh, New Mexico style Ornos, which are uh, mud ovens that we built on farm. They have a brick hearth and they maintain a temperature inside of about a thousand degrees, somewhere in there. We, we actually don't know for sure because our, our, we had a thermometer and it melted down. It was, it was rated for about 650 degrees or something and the, the thermometer melted. So a lot hotter than that. This is a, a, a really fun thing that we do. We love hosting the community. It's like having a party on the farm one week. Um, and we would do it probably pretty frequently, even if it were fin not financially remunerative, but it is very financially rewarding as well. And so this is, uh, this is a little bit dated because we were, uh, uh, this was, I think two years ago, we were doing $14 an adult. 
We're now $15 an adult, $7 for kids. Um, we have about 250 adults that come out and we don't, we don't worry about the kid numbers. They, they're, um, we don't worry about them making reservations. Uh, it's six months a year, May to October, every Thursday night. And so there's about, you know, between three, $3,500 and $4,000 a week gross, about $75,000 a season gross, and about $30,000 a season net. Now, this is pretty complex, and I, I'm not going to dig into it too deeply, um, but, but let's just say that it's, it is a really valuable part of how our farm works these days. And it's valuable in part because of the financial piece. It's also valuable because of the social capital that it provides. And I, I don't have any great crowd pictures of the pizza farm, but 250 people coming out to the farm every week to enjoy pizza and tour the farm. They don't know all tour the farm, but I take a farm tour. So usually between 20 and 40 people will join me for a farm tour each Thursday night. Um, they come out, they play with their kids in the yard, they listen to music, they relax, they see the farm. And it basically has meant the end of marketing for the CSA and for farmers market. And we just don't have to work at that anymore. And that's because people are coming and visiting the farm and experiencing it that way. Now, of course, it's its own set of work, and this is a tremendous amount of work. And, and we get to Thursday nights exhausted. You know, 10 o'clock at night, we're crawling into bed, we're worn out. And by October, we're ready for the end of pizza night for the year. Um, but at the same time, it's a fabulous experience for us and for our community. And people walk away from pizza night with a whole new appreciation of both uh, the beauty of local farms and also the level of work that it takes to produce food. Uh, in this environment. So I think it's a win, win, win. And uh, I just, I think that, you know, financial peace is really important because that's uh, pizza night. Uh, the income is not dependent on, you know, how the tomatoes do or whether the kohlrabi is a high producer this year or low producer, you know, it doesn't, if the carrot crop is a flop, it doesn't hurt pizza night's income um, and vice versa. You know, if we have a bunch of rained out pizza nights because it is a totally open air venue and if it's raining, we just can't do it. And uh, so that's a big financial hit, but you know, that doesn't necessarily diminish the vegetables. So here's again, you know, why do we diversify? And there's a couple of very specific examples of why that matters. Oh, there's a good crowd shot. Okay. Now I have a really wise, uh, a wise uh, step grandpa who's now passed away, but he always said a good income, a good uh, living needs three legs, like a three-legged stool. So there should always be uh, three legs supporting your stool because one or two legs isn't stable. And so uh, I, I've taken that to heart. So, you know, food production, growing vegetables, growing flowers, growing, uh, raising, uh, selling pizza, and then we'll get into the Airbnb here in a second as well. But, you know, that to me is just a wise way to, to live, that you don't have all, uh, as you know, the old farmer saying, it's not all your eggs in one basket, right? Or, or you're not relying on just one leg of the stool to hold you up. Plus, my wife is an incredible pizza chef and artist, and this gives her a tremendous creative outlet, gives her us all an opportunity to do something completely different than farming and be very social and interact in a way that we don't necessarily get to do the rest of the week. Okay, the final way we've really diversified the farm is in property. And so I wanna highlight here again, this, it, when we talk about farm incomes, production, programming, and property, I think should all be parts of any farm that's looking to build a resilient long-term income um, because they operate somewhat independently of one another and they complement each other in a lot of ways. You know, I would not have a farm tour income and pizza night would not be a success if we weren't also a functioning farm growing vegetables and flowers. At least that's my suspicion, because people want to see a working farm. Um, now, in property, um, one of the things that we've done, when we initially bought the property, we, we split our home into a duplex, and we rented out the lower side, lower uh, half of our house for about five years in the early years of our farm, and that was a tremendous boom. You know, $600 a month coming from um, tenants downstairs, and in this case, they were old college friends who had a family as well. And they wanted to live in, on the farm um, and they were very happy to contribute to the, to the mortgage and help things stay above, above uh, the bottom line. Uh, and we were thrilled to have them live with us. And so it was a win, win, win again. 
Um, but having rental property on the farm was a really big thing there initially. And we realized that was a huge piece of the way we succeeded. You know, six uh, $7,200 a year contributed to the bottom line was, uh, was nothing to sniff at at all. Uh, it still isn't, but you know, back in the day, that was the difference between having to get another job and being able to farm full time. So over the years, we took over that space because as you remember, I have five biological and five adopted kids. So we needed the space. We do still share part of our home with some interns and apprentices, but most of the space is now used by my family. That will change over the years, you know, as my family uh, starts moving out and doing their own things. And so there may come a time when we, again, you know, rent out a portion of our home. But meanwhile, the way we're doing rental income from the property, from the farm right now, earning income from the property, is we have a, uh, an Airbnb. And uh, this was actually built originally as my farm manager, Kimby's uh, home. She and her husband had it built down in Arkansas and hauled onto site. And they lived in it with their family for uh, several years. And then last year, they bought the 30 acres behind me with a house there. And so we bought the, the what we call the tiny turtle from them. Um, we call it the tiny turtle because it's green and it was slow. It was about six months late showing up. So, so they dubbed it the turtle. And that's, that name has stuck. But you can see it's a cute space. Um, it's not very big. Um, it's very cozy. It has a really nice aesthetic. Uh, and it's been a really popular Airbnb. Um, and so what does this mean uh, for us? Well, you can see in the corner here, uh, people are paying about $204 a night. Now, Airbnb takes their pound of flesh out of that. And then we pay uh, uh, our, our, one of the ladies who lives on farm with us, we pay her $45 uh, to clean the place. And that's a big, um, you know, so, so we get about, Ultimately, we get about $100 a night out of it. And we're currently renting it out at a rate of about 65% a month. Uh, it varies between about 80 and 40, depending on the season and so on. But uh, I mean, uh, percentage, I mean, so, so that's you know, somewhere around 15, uh, somewhere between uh, 25 and say 10, 10 uh, uh, nights a month. But so somewhere between 1,000 and $3,000 a month uh, income. And, that's been a really great shot in the arm for the farm. We've only been doing that for a, right at a year now, uh, but it's it is averaged a little over two thousand dollars a month on income on this uh, this small building, small cabin. Now, uh, let me just say too, this did not come cheap. Okay, so um, we paid uh, eighty thousand dollars for this little cabin, you know, to get it, and, and it's uh, so it'll be a little while before that's completely paid off. But I still view it as a very good investment because we, uh, we would not, th this one is another one that's totally independent of the other things that are going on on the farm. I mean, I think it's important that we have a functioning farm. I think that's part of the appeal of the place. But in terms of the, the, um, um, the income from it, it's not dependent on rain or sun. It's not dependent on pizza night going on. It's not depending on a lot of those other things that, that the, the, the rest of the farm income is. And so I like that a lot about it a lot. I also like that it's another way we interact with our community. A lot of people are travelers passing through. Uh, we get to make, meet inter interesting people that way. Although we interact with a surprisingly small number of the CSA, uh, I'm mean, sorry, of the uh, Airbnb guests. Uh, really, I'd say it's probably about 10% of the guests that really want to actually meet us. Um, most of them are just really happy to have a pleasant place to stay that's not in town that has, uh, you know, all the amenities of a home and is tucked away in this beautiful little farm in the Ozark. So it's, it's generally a really well-received thing. Um, just wrapping up here, and then I'll, I'll be glad to answer as many questions as, as people have. I think this is a really important premise. You know, farmers have got to be unafraid of taking risks. Now, that doesn't mean that we are fo foolish. But it does mean that we got to recognize that we live in a risky world. We do a risky profession. We got to be ready to take, ready to jump on opportunities when they come our way. Um, and uh, and so we, you know, this is a core. This is also. Oh, so here's my example of this. So this was a tunnel. This is a farm built tunnel. Um, somebody had called me, a, a greenhouse growing friend, and said, "Hey, I've got some some pipe that's uh, a little bit ice damaged. Would you be interested in it?" I said, sure. So he gave me this pipe and we built up the high tunnel here. 
And uh, for a couple of years, we grew tomatoes in it. And we had a couple of pretty good tomato crops out of it, some pretty good winter crops as well. And then this happened, you know, and, and I knew this was likely to happen eventually because the structure just wasn't a real robust uh, snow load type of structure. Uh, but, you know, the risk was worth taking because what we got in the meantime was two or three years of greenhouse growing or a high tunnel growing experience, plus, uh, you know, a lot of vegetables. So we made money. Um, we learned a lot. And we had this, you know, experience of growing greenhouse for several years, or high tunnels, before we had to spend big money on building a bigger high tunnel. Um, and so kind of a corollary to the risk taking thing is that uh, this idea, good enough is perfect, don't invest too much and stay flexible. You know, I, I don't think that, uh, that investing a couple hundred thousand dollars in infrastructure on your first couple of years of farming makes much sense. Um, it just seems to me like a huge risk. It's better to do, go lean and thin and figure it out as you go. Make sure that if something, you know, if this, this uh, endeavor fails, you're not sitting there with a big old uh, mortgage to pay that you have no way to, to do. And so diversifying to me is a big part of that. Uh, diversifying our income, diversifying our, our uh, offerings. But, uh, but all of it comes down to not being too much of a perfectionist because I think you can perfectionist your way right out of a good farm income. Um, so I, I would say you know, good enough is perfect. Don't invest too much, stay flexible. And then, you know, balance your life. Remember why we got into this. We didn't get into this because we wanna be slaves to the land. We got into this because we love being in the outdoors, working with our families, working with friends, uh, you know, doing these things. And then also remember that the farm isn't everything and getting off the farm, I think is important, especially for us. I don't know whether this is universal, but for us, we love getting out. We love being goofy in the woods. We love uh, paddling and hiking and doing these things. Uh, we also love travel and, um, and all those things have to, you know, to, to do those appropriately, we have to create space in our lives. We have to make choices, things like having an Airbnb, having a pizza night, support our choice that we want to travel and, and allow us to do more of that than we would be able to do if we were just doing vegetables. That's my perspective. Now, I have friends who just do vegetables and they do just fine with it. So it's not a one size fits all thing. And then I include this slide just to remember, why did we get into it? And in my case, I got into it because I wanted to spend time with my kids working on the line. Um, it's much bigger than that. And yet at the same time, if I ever lose sight of this goal, I will have lost the whole thing, I think. So. Important to keep, keep an eye on the goal. All right, so that is, uh, that's my presentation. Uh, we got more questions and answers. I'm glad to answer, or if, if that's all we have, that's fine too. Awesome, great, uh, that was great. So Shanna asks, uh, what is your suggestion to make the holes in fabric? Cutting them is so tedious, I agree. Um, do you suggest a different structure design or reinforcement regarding the HT design? Um, so cutting holes in fabric, and, and, and she's referring there to the, the woven black ground cover. Um, we love burning holes in fabric. That's turned out to be our favorite thing. And so we build a little frame out of, uh, out of wood, and then we attach uh, cans that have both ends cut out. Okay, so I've got like a, you know, I've got a cylinder, it's metal, it's got no, no ends, and I attach that to the, to the frame. So I've got like, I think on our, one of our frames has uh, four pineapple cans. Those are the right size cans, one of the bigger hole for that particular pattern. And so we set that down on the tarp and we stick a torch in the hole. And I mean, it takes uh, just seconds to burn a perfect round hole in the tarp on perfect spacing, pick up the frame and move it to the next one. So that that's, a, that's sealed, a really great tip that works well. Sorry to interrupt, that also seals the fabric around too, to have the burn holes, right? So there's no like, exactly. hole, yeah. Yep, yeah, because if you don't, and that was one of the things we learned was, you know, we did, for a while we just cut X's, and X's are great, they're, uh, you know, they'll work fine, but eventually they fray, and then you lose, you know, eventually your hole's this big instead of this yeah. Big, so, yeah. Um, and yeah, do you suggest a different structure design or reinforcement regarding HT design? Yeah, so our high tunnels, you know, we have, uh, as we've been able to afford it, we've bought increasingly robust high tunnels. So this is an example of, you know, at the time, good enough was perfect. And then over the years, as we've had um, the capital to invest, then we've bought more robust structures. And that mostly has meant buying uh, from 
uh, kits from places like Morgan County Seed, or um, I've got good friends who have lots of success with Rimmel tunnels or Atlas tunnels. There's a lot of really good companies out there now. Um, and then we've built some of our own that now are, are very robust as well. But mostly it's about the gauge of the pipe and figuring out, you know, uh, specifically on our big tunnels, they're two and three eighths inch pipe. So it's a pretty good sized pipe. And then it's a 14 gauge uh, metal. And those are just really, really strong. We don't worry about them in a snowstorm. I mean, I guess if we had like three feet of wet snow, I'd probably be out there shoveling snow off them. But I, I don't do it in any normal snowstorm that we've had. All right, um, that is it on the questions, but uh, we have some time, so feel free to submit any questions that you may have. Um, lots of thank yous from everyone. Oh, uh, someone commented that the um, you can use a creme brulee torch to, to make the holes. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be cool, right? Yeah. yeah. Again, um, feel free to submit any of the questions into the, into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and we did include Curtis's email if you have any questions. And, and you can always refer back to this, um, this video on YouTube. I like this, Kylie talks about having eight months of goats. I have an interesting thing where I, over the years, I've owned goats now, I think three times. And every once in a while I get this wild hair that somehow I'm gonna enjoy goats and I'm always wrong. Um, I enjoy them for about two or three days and then, then they're horrible little creatures again. Um, I think goats have the potential to be amazing you know, for many reasons, for land management, um, for the, the, the really interesting personalities um, I love goat's milk. Good goat's milk is hard to beat. But, you know, ultimately, um, I think it comes down on my behalf to mostly uh, time and, and uh, the ability to manage those. And I just never quite got there. So. Yeah, I grew up with goats. And um, when they would chew through the, um, the metal fencing, uh, which is like horrific like how how do they do that in the first place they would then stomp on our vehicles <laughs> yeah yeah i like, mean there's nothing respectful about a goat they, they just don't see anything in the world as non-goat territory so yeah they're, although, they're, they're a challenging creature you know hogs can be very difficult as well pigs and until we started doing solid fences we tried uh pigs in electric fence for a long time and we still do rotate them through electric fence occasionally but mostly we keep them in in solid walled pins now for the same reason but you know, ultimately, if we were going to keep things, um, if we were going to be able to have these two sort of entities, vegetables and hogs on the same farm, we really had to make sure that the hogs stayed where they belong, because they can get into the vegetable fields and do so much damage so quickly. I do. I do have one funny story before we get to this one question. Um, I was on an animal auction with my dad when I was really young, and he wanted to get um, a couple of goats. And uh, we finally settled on a price with the auctioneer. And then when the auctioneer hit the gavel, the goats uh, fell down. They were fainting goats. And so then the auctioneer re restarted the bidding, which is hilarious. They ended up selling pretty high. I was going to say, um, so fainting goats go higher or lower? Than yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, like $300 for. Oh, my gosh. But that was in like 2008, 2007. Yeah, that was crazy. Oh, bizarre. Um, yeah, okay, so, so I see Shauna's uh, question there about high tunnels getting too hot or too cold. Yeah. Um, so the, the simple answer is uh, no, they, there's always something we can grow in tunnels. Um, summer is the bigger challenge. There's a narrower range of crops that we can grow in uh, our tunnels in the summer, but that's really it depends on the tunnel. So uh, this picture that's, that's on the screen there is ginger uh, in September, maybe even October in the Chinese greenhouse. And the Chinese greenhouse is our most poorly ventilated, so therefore the hottest tunnel in the summer. And so the challenge there is that it just gets too hot and humid in there for a lot of crops. That said, the ginger doesn't mind at all. You know, the ginger's from Southeast Asia. It's, it's like the heat never bothered it. Um, and it does really well. Ginger, turmeric, both will tolerate very high temperatures. Um, 
to some degree, the cucumbers feel that way. There is a limit there. The cucumbers uh, do have problems when it gets over 100 regularly in the tunnel. That, that can be stressful for the cucumbers. Tomatoes will not do really well above 95, um, which is an interesting thing since that's what we're having weather-wise right now. So we expect to have a, a little bit of slump in tomatoes this summer, just based on them. Um, what happens is when they get too hot, they won't set fruit. So, oh, but we do a lot to keep them ventilated. So we have really high sidewalls on the tunnels and that helps keep the ventilation going. Now, the other thing is in the winter time, um, we really can do lettuce, spinach, kale, chard all through the winter in any of our tunnels, heated or unheated, and they do quite well. So, so no, in the winter time, we find the tunnels pretty much thrive uh, all through the winter. Does the heat also cause cracking with the tomatoes? Um, it's a factor, yes. So high heat tends to toughen the skins on the tomatoes. And then if they get too much water too quickly, then they'll crack. Um, but the, uh, the main thing that causes this cracking is, it, uh, is inconsistent water. So mm -hmm. having the water go, uh, in our case, we run it in the high tunnel, uh, the, our tomato tunnel. We're growing uh, basically for, so we're watering basically for uh, 45 minutes a day in there, but split into two different watering segments. So it's 20 minutes followed by an hour break and then another 20 minutes, it's kind of let the water percolate and spread out a little bit. Um, and that, that real consistent uh, water helps with the cracking. So we have very little cracking unless something happens to the, to the water supply. Awesome. Um, yeah, now, so there's a follow-up question. Um, do you prefer a greenhouse and, and a high tunnel or a semi-hybrid like the Chinese greenhouse? It, it depends on what we're trying to grow. I know that sounds like a cop out, but it's true that you know the, a variety of environments gives us a variety of options. So, for example, right now, um, you know, we're growing uh, celery in one of our little bitty tunnels, and part of the reason that works is because it's narrow enough we have really good ventilation, so the temperature doesn't really rise in there. But it also gets a little bit of shade because there's some some um, uh, uh, spray shade, which is a, like a white paint on top of the tunnel, so that so these leaf surfaces in that tunnel are actually cooler than they would be out in the open. So, um, so, you know, there would no, there'd be no advantage to a greenhouse in that situation. It would be uh, it's just gonna almost inevitably be hotter than what we've got out in this little bitty tunnel. Uh, but in the winter time, that greenhouse has a big advantage in terms of growing. So I think that, uh, you know, they all have their place. I really, I mean, growing in a, in a well-heated and ventilated greenhouse is certainly a luxury, but then of course the cost of that is also a luxury cost. So uh, just to put teeth to that, I think the last time I looked into it, um, uh, a full-scale uh, heated greenhouse with all the bells and whistles was running something like $25 a square foot, maybe even more, maybe $30 a square foot to build. And uh, whereas uh, a high tunnel um, can frequently be built for around, um, well, it, it varies. The, the price has been kind of wobbling all over the place recently, but. Uh, around five dollars a square foot, so that's a big difference. You know, you got to earn. You don't have to earn nearly as much money out of a high tunnel to make it make sense. Where a greenhouse has to really crank the dollars out uh, for it to make financial sense to own a high tunnel. I mean, a greenhouse. Um, Sheila asks in the uh, Q and A, "Do you have any experience with sheep?" No. <clears throat> um, that's the short answer. I had some t some. Uh, apprentices on farm who kept sheep for a little while and um, that you know they seemed to really enjoy them but I steered clear of them um, they are a little seem to be a little easier to contain than goats in some ways but uh, but and I, we never really had problems with them getting out and roaming around so that was nice um, but they didn't seem disease prone that was a problem an ongoing issue with them as parasites and, uh, and other uh, nutrient problems and so on so I think whether that would have settled over time, I don't know. They they still got their sheep. They're still happily sheep owners. So, I think it's I think sheep, goats, all that stuff comes down a lot to personal farmer preference. All right, that looks like it's it on the questions. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, use the resources provided at the beginning of the workshop. Um, and this has been a this has been an awesome workshop. Thanks so much for having. For, um, Thank you. The, the awesome. Thank you.